So here we are. Um, our first artist talk with Joseph, and so I didn't prepare any questions for this. I thought about a few things, but um, this is really an informal Me conversation neither. between two old friends. Um, I've known Joseph for over over 12, 12, 15 years, something like that. It's going on 20. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in, in 2008, Joseph and I co-founded the artist collective SRQ, which is still in operation today. Um, we've, we've been friends, we've done kind of studio handed, visits. Handed the ball we've to the younger gen. Painted side by side, we've done live painting events, and it, so when this opportunity came forward to do something like this, it was a very natural thing to ask one of my best friends to have an exhibition such as this. So um, we're really lucky to have him here. So I don't know how many of you know Joseph. I'm just going to start from the beginning. Joseph, when did you move to Sarasota? Uh, 1990. I was living in New York City, going to new school, and there was three blizzards that winter. <laughs> And I said to myself, my grandmother lives in Sanibel. Where's the closest art school that I could go to the beach every day? <laughs> With not any intent or interest or how good the school was or how the professors were, I didn't care. I just wanted to get out of the cold. <laughs> I came here and I showed up and I was ecstatic to find that the school was great, the professors were interesting, I made friends right away, some of them are in the room, and I came with the intent of being here for two years. I'll do two years in the sun, it's fantastic, great studio time, I, bought, I got a house across the street from the school that had a studio attached, and I'm going to have a grand old time. Well, that grand old time is still going on now. <laughs> The place got its hooks in me, and I love this town. I love the light. I love the place. I love the smell. I love the people. I love even the stupid growth. <laughs> it behooves me to love this thing that might support all of us, that the town is getting bigger. Do I miss the little sleepy fishing village with a world-class ballet? A little bit, but... We're Sarasota. We are Sarasota. And I am Sarasota through and through. I've been here now freaking 30 years. So how would you say that your art has changed uh, I don't know, how, since the time that you graduated till now? You had a studio on Central Avenue for... 25 years. 25 I, 20 years. years I lived on this street. Pushed down hard. There you go. Um, this is my neighborhood, which is fantastic because this gallery sort of is like me coming full circle. I've lived on this street in every single building from Fruitville to 13th Street over the course of 25 years. This is my house. And to have a new gallery come in a new building and invite me to be part of it was cathartic and like cohesive and it meant something that somebody that I cared about like asked me so it was kind of coming full circle I love this part of town I've always loved this part of town because it felt like a little tiny bit of city in the middle of a sleepy growing town now the rest of the town has grown up and now this is now catching up and becoming more city-esque if you will I think that the gallery opening here just makes sense and me being in it makes sense and Tim and I being together in it in the endeavor makes sense I don't know how else to explain it so uh, it just makes sense for Christ's sake so it's Sarasota is still supporting your work uh, otherwise you would have left pop perhaps maybe so so the thing is about Sarasota is Sarasota is well, Sarasota was a pink facade with no house. And we loved it for that because it was artsy without being art-centric. Now it is 
supporting world-class ballet and world-class orchestra, the world, the, one of the best museums in the world, those things have always existed, but now they seem to have all gotten their shit together a little bit, and we're on the world stage, and the town is growing around us. Now, visual arts has been like the kind of lonely stepchild that's sort of trying to catch up. We started the visual artists started a kind of revolution with people like Mark Urelli and and John Chamberlain being here and Rauschenberg being so close and there's monsters of art that have like existed in on this soil have walked in these streets I mean John Chamberlain got punched in the face right there <laughs> right there so this is my town now and this is my art and this is how I feel like I need to exist in this town is making as much art as I can for the people that are here and then taking our art out of the town too and using Sarasota as our moniker. So when it goes out of town, Sarasota becomes a name that produces artists, that produce positive, strong, relevant work. And this is my fervent dream and hope. And, you know, hopefully some people buy some shit and I can feed my kid. <laughs> so I'm going to ask kind of a, a loaded question and, and then I want to start taking some questions from everybody here. There's many reasons why people fall in love with artwork and artists. And I think of those many reasons, some of them are because of the aesthetics of their work and then the story behind the work, whether it's the artist or actually the, the story in the piece itself. Can you talk a little bit about the aesthetics of what's on this wall, and then perhaps we could talk about two or three pieces? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, let's start with just saying that the impetus for this show was my underlying theme has always been uh, a cloud shape. That's why I love Sarasota so much. We don't have mountains, we don't have changing landscape, we have a changing eastern and western cloudscape. I'm fascinated and in love with the sky here, the light here is Mediterranean and dirtier and brighter somehow. It's fucking amazing. <laughs> I love it. And it's part of the reason that I couldn't leave. Every two years I had a plan, let's get out of this town, let's go somewhere, no. Sarasota is my town because the light and the thing and then it's about finding materials I always find stuff everyone wants to get rid of stuff and I want to get it <laughs> I want to root through your trash like a raccoon and make stuff out of it and sell it back to you and show you how pretty the stuff you just threw away is um, let's talk about just this in particular like, it's about the history of Sarasota. It's the about the first piece of the new series. It's the first piece of this whole new series. Um, I found an umbrella on the side of the road. I'm fascinated with mid-century modern stuff. This is the interior of the umbrella. But then I was looking and reading about the history of Sarasota and how Mark Iorelli, who is an artist that I love a lot, and he's abstract and it's a little bit cold but whimsical and he worked here, he lived here, and Chick Austin was one of the people that brought him and other people down here to teach at New College in the 50s. And I just thought, what if Chick Austin went to the beach? Like, he's this cold bauhaus -y sort of dude, and I'm just picturing him on the beach finding an umbrella, and what if he took that umbrella and cut it up and made work that he made, and then, yeah, so. You, you get the drip, that's just how it ends up this. I just like presupposing that the people that are, is my history combined with the history of the town, combined with the history of the people that I admire, put them all together and you end up with what I hope is something that people want to look at or just even just experience for a couple of minutes, whether or take it home with you and experience for a lot of minutes. Speaking of taking it home, Joseph, <laughs> nice. there's four wonderful pieces right here that all so deal with Sarasota. These all were built 
out of a piece of wood that floated up while I was at the Hermitage Artist Retreat, which is just a little bit south of here in Inglewood. Inglewood? Off the coast of Inglewood. Minnesota Key, thank you. Um, and I was painting on little bits of wood that, I, it was just called Flotsam and Jetsam. I just only made stuff out of crap that floated up and I was there for a storm and a lot of crap floated up. So <laughs> I made a lot of stuff out of that series. And it was about my experience in Florida and what I was seeing in storms and the idea of lifeguard stations being the place of safety that you look when you're broken but then the aloneness of them on a that's the only thing and the only structure on a beach when shit goes sideways so something about that just kind of appealed to me and then uh remembrance of somebody that influenced me a lot leslie lerner and Something about like him feeding me ideas and me and techniques and him being such a dick to me. And who was Leslie? At Turner? perfect moments. He was like the greatest teacher I ever had. He was the reason that I stayed here. When I came to Florida for the two years, he was the teacher that made me stay the third. He was the guy. But he did it in such a dickish way that I loved him for it. He would wait till everybody stopped talking and he would go, you know, that sucks, but you know, you could do it a little bit better, but in a better way. And I just, I just loved him for it. And I wanted to do it in a better way because he said, and that little series is about him and my experiences on Hermitage. And it really was that way. Yeah, it was, it's like, it was amazing. Like he would wait till everyone else stopped talking and he'd go, yeah, that's good, but not. <laughs> oh my God. Wow, awesome, yes. I'll make, I'll do better. So this painting right here um, has a lot of gold in it. And when, when we were talking about the whole idea of this exhibition, um, you had just started working on some of these gold paintings. Can you talk about those a little bit? Yeah, so um, I'm fascinated with mid-century modern design. I live in a mid-century modern house. I drive a mid-century modern car. I drive mid-century modern. Everything in my life, the only thing in my life that's new is my baby, my wife, and my television. Everything else is from 1950. Um, so something about ads from the 50s and textures from the 50s and old billboards and this is an old front door from the house in my neighborhood. I love stuff that just like ends up in dumpsters that's just so beautiful that I can't stand it. I diving in dumpsters in my neighborhood. People think I'm like a mad dog raccoon. But <laughs> like this is insanely beautiful. And this was an old front door from a neighbor. Like, and this is an ad, uh, uh, an amalgam of several ads, but it's ads for haircuts in, 19, in the same era. And the haircut is called the hat killer because haircut's so good you couldn't possibly put a hat on it. And I just... Oh, that's so good. I can't stand it. And just we can't, can't, like combine those things together with the materials that it's made out of. And then I'm fascinated by grisaille painting of the same era. There was a resurgence of the Renaissance era in the 50s and grisaille painting in Italy and the grisaille ear. Like it's like a secret that you're going to tell this black and white ear about a hat that is so good that it might kill your haircut. <laughs> I know all of you have some questions out here. Does anybody have a question about any piece of artwork in the show or for Joseph? Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to have a question. I have a question. Please. You use a lot of sanding. Can I do. Can you talk about that? Either? So I think the, the application of what I think and the removal of what I think is just as important. I think that memory, my work is a lot about memory. That's the common goal the common thread through the cloud forms are the common motif. Memory is the common law to me. Memory is a lot like a piece of advertising, a piece of wood, an object in space. Time degrades it. Action degrades it. Weather degrades it. Our mem it, it all gets degraded. So as a 
a metaphor for the degradation of our memory. Sanding works perfect. You just and you get in there and just remove some of the stuff that you've already done and reveal some of the stuff that you've already done before that so that you get all these, the historic layers and then the way that they all work together is sort of magic or sort of crap. Like there's, <laughs> there's only one way or the, the, sometimes the sanding, like there's 14 more of these in my garage that they're getting painted over tomorrow. <laughs> but there's magic to reveal something that you've already done. I, I don't know, something about that reveal is just as important as something that you've applied. I hope that. Any more questions? Please. I'd just like to say I love the trip you gave to Lesson Learn with the figures and the. That, that motherfucker. <laughs> He's my friend. He was one of my favorite people in the whole world, and I don't think he liked me at all. I bet he did. <laughs> I wanted you to talk about the big thing because this is kind of reminiscent of what you have been doing in the past, and I love these things. So, my big work is like kind of, I don't know, I love working big. And you, you've done several large pieces. Yeah. yeah, so like my lion, the lion's share of my work is, this is like half the size of it. Like today I installed something that's 12 feet long and this tall. Like that's where my like bread and butter is, I guess. I don't know. It's, I like working with my arm, but I also like working like this. But these pieces, these intimate little um, studies, they're like almost like, um, I don't know, masturba masturbation is the wrong word. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's like something about just like handling the materials and just handling like the little tiny things. They give me the ideas for the bigger works. I like working on them and I like noodling with them but they always end up doing something of scale. I like the scale. Uh, so the theme of this is twofold. It's um, it's about a jazz album that I in the mood that I what yeah it's maybe my top it, it no it's in my top three maybe my top one album of all time and then it's about the same sort of theme and the, I don't know. So for a long time, there was a female element to my work that was very, very prevalent. And she has been a character in my work and she has been slowly and utterly leaving. She's been based on my grandmother and she has been slowly and I don't even know how to say it. Like she's been leaving my work and this may be the last appearance of her like as she kind of leaves the frame. I don't know how to describe it. It's just something that I'm dealing with. One of the things that we were talking about when we were putting this exhibition together was that you have- Let all these damn people in. You have- um, They can't work the door. The endings of several different series here. And the beginning of a couple of new series. My wife, my child, my friend, like, they're standing out front. Come on. Hey. That's my baby. And my wife attached to it. So we have the, the blonde one, not the other one. So we have the ending of a couple of different series, including. Yeah, this so this here. show was a really perfect, cathartic moment to take a moment with this little intimate space and take a moment in my studio and with myself and look at all the unfinished and unrealized series and make the last one so that I could have a moment and seeing them up on the wall all together. And it's not exactly a retrospective, but it speaks to a lot of years in Sarasota, and it speaks to this street that I've been on for so long, 
And then that moment, I feel like it releases me to make new shit. <laughs> like, like, I'm free of a lot of ideas that I didn't ever finish. And man, was it nice to pull all, <laughs> all this stuff on the, off the shelves that I wasn't quite done with. Like, I'm gonna finish this one, I'm gonna finish this one, I'm gonna finish this, like, it was nice. It, it, this, I can't thank Tim enough for cattle prodding me off my ass <laughs> and getting me out of the woodwork. I was like lost a little bit, a little tiny bit. Like it's easy to have so many different disparate ideas going in different, different directions and then have your life take a hold, a new wife, a new baby, a new whatever, to let that overwhelm you and not get back to ideas that you started. And it was, this was a nice opportunity to finish some of those ideas, put it all together in a kind of cohesive and make it make sense with a cohesive line of the cloud motif, a cumulus being a cumulus cloud and accumulate all the crap that I collect. <laughs> Everyone can testify. Speaking of collect, Joe, why not canvas for some pieces? Why canvas sucks. I, I'm curious on your perspective. No, nope. canvas, canvas can suck my... Uh, are gorgeous. Canvas sucks. Okay, good. So I can't do this to a piece of canvas. <laughs> it takes longer to do. Like, look, you can do that to canvas? Come on. I specifically like the way you can set your wine glass. No, come on, look! <laughs> Are you doing that to canvas? Do you Excuse me, hold on one second. Do you feel that... Um, you worked for the, the Ringley Museum for a number of years. Ten years as their exhibit designer. Did, did the materials that uh, you dealt with, the paintings... Fuck to the yes. And so that carried over into your own work in regards to the, the board so and Formica? Or? There is something that happened between the Renaissance and modern day painters that painters got lazy. Painters stopped being interested in the materials that they painted upon. They could just buy a roll at the art store. If you look at a Raphael, it doesn't paint on canvas for the most part. It was painted on wood with an architect. The back of those things is insane. There's like a whole structure to hold the painting. Speaking of which, that's a part that most people don't see. Here, like see this on, but nobody sees the good that's why we. That's why we did this. And that painting that's in the window is a triple fold. So it's made out of a crate lid from a, a famous painting that traveled the world with me. And then the fabric that it's painted on is Chick Austin's uh, Fortuny fabric that he picked from Venice and hung in the Oslo Theater. And then when they knocked the Oslo, the other Oslo Theater down, uh, the Florida state system in their infinite wisdom said that we couldn't have any of the fabric because it was part of the state number and that had to be destroyed rather than kept. So what I did was jump through the back window as the bulldozer was going through the front window and went in there with my knife and cut out a bunch. <laughs> You're not putting this on the interwebs, right? <laughs> anyway, very illegally I took what I wanted because I think it's insane to throw that kind of stuff away. As is every single thing in this gallery was thrown away by somebody at some point and it comes with its own inherent history that is amazing to me like you can't start the story of one of these without like the shit that it's made out of like that's part of it to me i build the thing and it's happy to me as an object and then i impart the message that i want to impart to you upon it. So I hope that the two are cohesive enough to, that it, the feeling of my love for the beauty of the unobserved beauty of discarded object is put together in such a way that I can put an image on it and you can get that all from it. You can get the, the beauty of the 
object and the materials and the image and all of it, you don't know why you like it. You just do. You're like, oh, damn, I feel that because it's the pine floor of a house that I used to live in. That reminds me of this. Like, that should be more, the material should be more from your guts, like from your, it's guttural, like to me. And then the image is my nostalgia and my memory. And then the and patina and the paint is how age and memory combine the three. Very good. Any more questions? Oh, I want one. Please. Thank you for your wonderful Hi, Peter. <laughs> your hallucinations of your craft. My hallucinations. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to know what that devil's saying. I'm sorry, what now? What the devil's, what, what the, 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 uh, Let's go. the that's all the there. there. Oh, so it's the, the we're talking the reason about the piece that I, that's facing the, the street. The, the, the reason that I included the devil, well, the skull, the skull, the skull yeah. piece, um, was because it seemed like the most coherent beginning of this series of cloud motifed pieces. I started the series about sketching all these slate clouds and I called them monsters from the east because every Saturday, every day in the summer, clouds build up in the east and create these beautiful forms, these beautiful shapes, these beautiful like I don't know, you're a kid, you're laying a hill, you look at the thing, you're like, that's a donkey. It's, <laughs> it's like, a, it's a skull. And whenever else in the first one that I looked at, and the first one that I painted was a skull. And it was very clear. And I drew it in my sketchbook several times, and then I made it spit the words monsters from the east. It was the natural, it's the only piece in the show that doesn't, isn't brand new. It's the only, it's 10 years, 15, it's oh, no, 20 no, no, years no. old. It's the only one. Everything else is brand new. It just seemed right to include it because it sort of was the kind of like the kickoff for this whole... I don't even know. <laughs> this whole box of stuff. And I don't know, something about the way that it came about finding of the lid of the crate, stealing of the fabric, the observant of the clouds from the east, the creation of the monster in my mind, the, it's regurgitating the title of the show. It just worked. I'm interested in your commentary about subject. I'm enjoying your talking about discarded objects and the amount of history that you have in Sarasota and your connection with the Ringling Museum. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about the discarded studio and residence on 10th Street that belonged to John and Chen. So, John and I, um, it's funny because we have a great connection, John and I. The first time I met John was at his 50th birthday. I was invited over here on 10th Street. I went to his party. I crumpled up a beer can in his face and told him he was an asshole. And he crumpled up, he picked up a piece of metal and autographed it and was like, no, you're an asshole. And then we became very good friends. <laughs> like, in, an, in a minute. Like, in a minute. And I think he might be the only person that was drunker than me at that moment in time. Because ten minutes later, or that night later, he got punched out, like, right here on the street by some homeless guy for... I don't know. I, he didn't even have any money. Like, I don't even know why he got punched out. Probably because he told him he was an asshole. <laughs> As we do. <laughs> but I think that him moving... I know. <laughs> for Christ's sake. I think that it's a shame that that space, among others, and this whole quadrant of town that is so close to business-centric and so close to gallery-centric is losing some of its spaces, starting with, you know, 10th Street Studio where Scotty Sr. and, like, some of the best artists in town were before, before the... Not Goodwill. What's the damn 
Salvation Army moved in at the end. But I think it's a... Um, you don't want to hear my conspiracy theory. I think it's all a chess game to make values of property go down so people can buy things and build things like this. But John didn't like invest or he just bought a piece of property and built shit till he was sick of it or was sick of doing it and or was being supported and moved to Shelter Island. Like the hard thing is is that Sarasota loves to call itself an art town, but it's not super supportive of us as artists. And not meaning that we're they're not like lining up to buy the work, but if you're gonna bank on us as artists, as your creative capital and your reason for drawing people in, you'd think that there would be a way to make us stay longer, harder, faster, and give us a break on things like studio space, living accommodations. I'm not asking for a handout. I never have, but gentrifying to the point of uh, extinction of gallery space or studio space is short-sighted, I think. Or not revering the residents of the world-renowned artists. It's You're right. The, same, the context applies to both. Yes, I to, agree. We need to do more of that. I think, it's, I think we're losing what we're, we used to have. Like, there's been world-famous artists that have shown and come all the way back to Picasso with Chick Austin with the first, the, I mean, some of the first modern art shows in the freaking United States were here by Chick Austin. Some of the first plays, some of the first, more, like, some of the biggest things that ever happened in the arts happened here. And then we have an architecture school named after us because after the war, 15 of the best architects in the world moved here. Like, why not put that up front rather than like, you know, how sugary the damn sand is. I love sugary sand. I want to be in it all the time. But at the same time, like, those things have to be weighed against each other and maybe we attract people that might, uh, I don't know. Don't get me started. Why are you getting me started? Who brought her in? Who, whose guest is she? I'm on that subject. I, I wish there were more passion about it. I'm, I'm, I'm sad. Well, this is a good topic for us to have a bigger discussion on with the gallery. Um, I, for one, am one of the fans of that the gallery is not just a place where we exhibit artwork and try to sell it and put money in artists' pockets. I love you, a by the way. A space like this is, is here to create dialogue. And so I'm, I am trying to pitch the gallery, you know, that's part of, and along with the art center. Well, that's sort of a salon concept that these, you're dealing with here tonight. These conversations need to happen more often. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Thank you. Know, do you know of anything that is happening in that direction? Which direction are we talking about? Like This conversation in the gallery. Supporting, supporting artists in the community. <laughs> It's always on the agenda, but it's never ends up on the finale. The Arts and Culture Alliance this year, I think, did a, there was a survey, and it was like, what kind of things are you looking for? And you had to check, like, metal sticking. Yes, the 15th survey in 25 years. <laughs> so, you know, like... <laughs> Sar Sarasota has always had, a, a, in my experience, in, in 20 years, Yes. It's about a five to nine year cycle, something similar to this. And it, it goes with the economy as well. Um, but what's nice to see is that it's never gone away. Well, it, always, it also brings it back to how Tim and I sort of like really congealed our friendship was in the face of this kind of apathy about how young artists exist and where we show and what the fuck we do and how we do it. We're just like, screw this, on a cocktail napkin, we created SRQ and just did it ourselves. And it became like a thing. It wasn't like a giant boon, but it was a place that we could see. Thank you. It, was a, it wasn't about like awesome, it was about like, holy crap, stop buying art from everywhere else. Two blocks from your house, there's the same kind of painter that you're buying stuff from, and he needs your help. 
That's so, what our SRQ was about. The simple answer that I have, because there really is no written remedy, I think, for any of this, is show up and be present. Encourage your friends to show up and be present. Spread the word. <coughs> spread the good news. <coughs> tell them what's happening and participate. That's really just it. The more that we can do that, the better it's going to be. And and buy all, local art. Just like that. <laughs> and buying local art. So <laughs> And then you kind of like knock on your, your paintings and stuff, and I feel like you make it accessible for us. Like, I feel safe that I could come here and pick it up, look at it. Hey, what the fuck are you doing, lady? <laughs> Where's security? <laughs> <laughs> like, I feel like, it, like I, it's more like accessible to me. Before, like when I walked on well, the like, this is my you know, ardent like, desire yeah, that you will be able to just look at it and be like, I know this. I know this material. I I recognize it. It's it's not exactly familiar to me, but it is. Like that's part of the process for me in my own work is that you recognize not only the images but the materials that it's made out of. Like that gives you a sense of like I don't know home. Yeah. Like there's. A there's a moment that you look at a piece of art that you love. And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about in general. And when you see that piece of artwork that you love, you don't know why you love it. You just love it. And you love it from your crotch to your brain to your breast. To, you love it. You love it with your whole being. And you don't even know why. Because it's the materials, the image, the way that the artist, you don't even, you can't identify, like someone's gonna ask you like, why do you love this piece? And you're like, I, I just have to be near it. <laughs> that's what art is to me. And that's what I hope that some of this portray, like uh, gets on you. It just wants to get on you. Like <laughs> it does, it just, it, it seriously, like you walk through, I'll walk through the Met, 500 times, I've been there a thousand times. Some days you just plow through galleries and you go for one painting. And then other days you're just like, some painting calls to you for that day and you spend time with it. You might go through the whole museum and go back to it. Something about that painting just calls your name. Something about the materials and the mark making and the thing that the artist was, you don't, you don't know why and that's not, that's not your job, it's not the artist's job, it's my job to portray what I see and what I feel out of these materials and your job is just to fucking like the what you like. There you go. That's it. Well thank you all very much for coming this evening.